Uh, welcome everyone to this week, Friday, July 10th, IPM virtual forum um, under the hashtag IPM responds as we continue to adapt to the global pandemic. Um, I'm sure as all of you know, the numbers continue to increase and spike across the United States. We've had five of the highest daily totals ever in the last 10 days and uh, India, where we have a long-standing office, and Brazil, where we have a strong presence, and heard from Rodrigo Perret, our International Executive Board member at a forum a couple weeks ago, are now second and third in global cases. So we share that unfortunate um, leadership and uh, the spread of the pandemic and the impact it's having on everyone. Um, I saw numbers last night that the United States is now over 3 million cases um, and will probably be at at least 135,000 dead by Sunday, um, also leading the world at this point. And um, I can tell you from a little incident I had, I uh, had an issue swimming this week and I had to get some stitches in the bottom of my uh, foot, which I won't go into too much detail, uh, but I will tell you that... Um, even the hospital here where I live was not willing uh, to test me because they still have so little tests available to them. So while I know tests are available at, at drugstores and places like Cleveland, um, they're not in many parts of the country still, which of course continues to um, create havoc for those who don't know whether or not they're positive and how to respond and keeps many of us separated from one another as much as I would like to be able to be physically with many of you on the Zoom call and on Facebook Live, uh, whether it's in St. Louis, Cleveland, or El Salvador, uh, we're all holding off on travel as a staff um, until the situation clarifies itself much more fully. And that um, includes having postponed all of our immersions up until at least November at this point. We're still hoping to have a open delegation go to El Salvador um, on November 28th in conjunction with the anniversary of the four church women being murdered there in 1980. Um, if that does not happen, it'll be a virtual program. In the coming weeks, one of these forums will be a presentation on the wonderful new virtual immersion experience program, an update on that uh, that my colleague Vicki Jimenez and I have been working on that we're really excited uh, to be rolling out to the public um, uh, by August 1st. Today, uh, and that may have something to do with the smaller numbers, you don't get to hear from anyone exotic, uh, you get me. Um, we're hoping that Rosalie Kell, uh, our colleague who's done a lot of work with the Wabanaki people here in Maine, um, who are really and appropriately hunkered down right now to prevent the spread in their communities. We know the terrible history of uh, disease uh, and the way that it's impacted or really wiped out much of our native population over time. Um, they're being very careful about the spread, but we're hoping that Rosalie, who has led a number of IPM immersion experience delegations among the Wabanaki here in Maine, will be able to give us a presentation um, on that work and update us on their situation in the coming weeks. Uh, next week, we're planning on the forum being led by Sony Shrestha, and she may be joined by Fumati if we can make the connection work to update us on Nepal. There is some question about trying to move it up a little earlier, given that Nepal is 10 hours and 45 minutes ahead of the East Coast of the United States. So we might move the forum up to 10 o'clock, uh, but we'll be communicating with you about that um, in the coming days. So I'd like to begin by thanking um, my colleagues, Ilsa, Mahesh, Adela, and Anada in particular for providing much of the information that I'm gonna share with you today. We thought appropriate since we started this virtual forum program in conjunction with our 46th anniversary on May 10th, that now that we're at July 10th, it would be a good thing to sort of take a breath and talk a little bit more broadly about where, how IPM has been responding over the last two months and what our plans are uh, for the balance of the summer. And we continue to, um, as always, humbly partner uh, with our project partners in the lead along, um, around the world. And we're learning, as you all know, along the way 
um, given this really new effort for us around emergency relief, which hasn't ever really been at the core of this organization. So let's begin now, and I'll, I'll talk for 20 minutes or so, and then be happy to open it up for questions uh, and comments. Uh, the first photo you can see is a beautiful picture recently from uh, India. And what I'd like to say is that, you know, what we've learned during this two month period has really been about in a reaffirmation of IPM's mission all along about putting our hands together, getting our hands dirty, if you will, um, and sharing in solidarity with one another. Because when we're united in solidarity, our potential and capacity to impact the world and make the change we wanna see is that much greater. Um, our response to the COVID-19 pandemic um, has been um, extensive. And as I mentioned earlier, beyond sort of what IPM typically does as far as immediate relief support. Uh, and we wouldn't have been able to do any of that without the generosity and time and talent and treasure of many of you and partners around the world and others who aren't able to join us on this call. I will remind you that we continue to have the Spanish language forum each day um, at one o'clock Eastern, excuse me, at two o'clock Eastern time and we will have that today with Maria Felix from Mujer and Comunidad in San Francisco Libre, Nicaragua. So if you'd like to learn more about what's happening in that part of the world, that would be a great opportunity to do that. Uh, but we remain deeply grateful for all the support we've received. Uh, we have a 50 cent on the dollar match commitment up to $100,000 that we kicked off around our anniversary. We just set a follow-up um, e appeal and uh, paper mailing, and you should be expecting board calls if you haven't given yet, so I would encourage you to think about how you might support this campaign. Many of you already have. We're at about 57% of our goal right now, having raised over $85,000, but we still have quite a way to go, um, and we're grateful for everyone's generosity in helping us sustain the really important work of our partners at this critical and really unprecedented time. So IPM has been responding around the world in a number of different ways. Our largest office currently um, is in Latin America and the Caribbean in El Salvador. Uh, we have three uh, regular staff there, Adela Zayas, um, who many of you have heard from in both English and Spanish language forums, who's our international director of programs and partnerships and also still serving as the regional director for Latin America and the Caribbean. And then uh, Vicky and Aneda, who are actually in the photo uh, at the left of your screen. Vicky Jimenez is our Immersion Experience Coordinator, and Aneda Ramos is the Regional Associate with a particular focus on work with our project partners. Uh, but one of the things that's, you know, almost the perfect storm, bad analogy, is in the middle of the pandemic, uh, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and much of Central America was hit with two storms. Uh, Amanda and Cristobal. And so we not only were trying to respond to the pandemic, but had to respond to the to those tropical storms as well uh, through emotional, financial, material, personal, and or professional support during this unprecedented crisis. The photos, um, just in case you're curious, are again, are Vicky and Aneda picking up some supplies at a local shop in El Salvador a group outside our longstanding project, Partnu Aku Mujerza, formerly known as um, Mujer and Comunidad in El Salvador. Those of you might remember that name. Um, the one, the second from the right, is at the uh, um, grinding and bakery facility of Acapamu in Armenia. And then further on the right there is a distribution of supplies. Um, I believe that is in the community of Mexicanos, San Ramon, just um, on the outskirts of the capital of San Salvador. Um, when we talk about the ways that we're responding, um, in the presentation that Aneda gave a, a few weeks ago, we talked about emotional support, which is really a whole nother level of partnership that I believe IPM is always engaged in sort of just by osmosis, but hasn't had such a focused effort in. But we're really um, fortunate that both Adela and Vicky are trained psychologists 
and Anita has extensive experience working with women in community-based organizations. And so as they have written here, um, we see emotional support is the ability for others to feel loved, to feel listened to, um, and to have a sense of, of well-being um, or being in a better place despite the circumstances in which we live. Um, we conducted a satisfaction survey amongst our Latin American partners, and we received a number of responses, primarily from El Salvador and Nicaragua. And as you can see on this chart that Aneda and um, Adela prepared, we've been providing workshops, uh, Skype and Zoom meetings, calls, WhatsApp chat, a number of ways to stay connected uh, with our partners in the region. And in fact, that was so successful and so well received that that's why we um, opted to move to a weekly Zoom chat at two o'clock that all of the Spanish speaking partners are able to participate in. And um, that's just been a wonderful way, I think, for all of us, uh, particularly those of us who can't travel to be with one another right now to stay connected. Um, as you can see, Aneda and Vicky um, in the photo at right, Aneda's on the left, Vicky on the right, uh, facilitated a video training for our project partners. This one in the case of um, Mujer and Comunidad in rural San Francisco Libre in Nicaragua um, to deal with some of the emotional psychosocial issues related to the COVID-19 pandemic. As some of you know that those partners are really an extraordinary cooperative of women who deal primarily in combating the prevalence of domestic violence and even incest um, in their local community. So they're already dealing with people who have been through um, almost unbelievable trauma on a daily basis. They're lawyers, doctors, nurses, advocates, social workers as part of the cooperative. Um, there's a lot of stress there. Um, as Clint and one of his colleagues pointed out a few years ago when they visited, um, a lot of PTSD as well as just um, ongoing trauma. And so it was really, really well received. And the video that um, Vicki and Anita prepared is available on YouTube as well, if you'd like to check that out on the IPM Connect YouTube channel. We've also continued with these Zoom calls, which I think have been good for all of our mental health. I know they have been for mine. They can be exhausting at times, but some of you will probably see your your faces or your uh, bald head, in my case, <laughs> uh, in these photos of prior uh, forums. And we hope to be able to continue these at least through the summer. Uh, and as I've said, we also have new WhatsApp chat groups for each of our regions. So the Latin American partners, the South Asian partners, the Sub-Saharan African partners, and all their colleagues and friends, no matter where they are in the world, are able to stay in regular communication with one another. And it's really been a wonderful way to uh, accompany each other during this unprecedented time and in the midst of this crisis. Uh, there are some other sort of even more creative things. Probably won't ever see me, see me lead a dance class. I'll try my hand at a very, uh, very quiet meditation class. Uh, but Adela is very gifted at yoga and Vicky is a uh, dancer by uh, advocation as well as vocation. And uh, so she recently posted a series of videos for her community, particularly to help children with learning how to express them th some, themselves through movement and through dance as a way to deal with the stress that um, is so prevalent in our conversations here now in the United States about will children go back to school or won't they? And what will that mean for their mental health? Dance and meditation and yoga, obviously any way that they can use their bodies um, in a productive way is a really good way to relieve their stress uh, during these quarantine times. Financial support has obviously always been uh, a primary concern of IPM in the way that we respond to our partners. We like to think and we certainly believe that our partnerships are go much beyond sort of a transactional nature of grantor and grantee as many foundations um, function in that way, or certainly a lot of relief organizations are simply about moving relief supplies and dollars, which is important. Uh, but we also do many other things with our partners. But this little chart shows you just some of the Latin American partners that we've been providing direct financial support to during this time of crisis. 
we're making, I should have clarified on the last slide, we're making monthly scheduled payments to each of the Latin American partners. So that's why you see the seven that are listed there that have received their monthly donation through the beginning of the year. Um, and also keeping the staff in place. Um, we're one of the few organizations I know that hasn't had to let anyone go um, through staff give backs and meeting together and talking about what was a regional way, to, a reasonable way to share the burden. We've happily been able to keep everyone um, on staff and even to provide support for some of our longstanding consultants, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But that I was saying, we're continuing with the annual or the monthly donations to each of our partners, and then also making some extraordinary contributions um, in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. Our largest funding recipient on an annual basis continues to be the Patronato Lydia Cocciola, named for an Italian philanthropist who was in El Salvador during the time of the Civil War there. Uh, many of you have visited. It's a remarkable program, but obviously one uh, focused on children and unable to generate income in their own work. So pictured at left is Sandra, one of the teachers. There was a wonderful video that they've been posting a number of videos for kids that are at home. This was sort of a science experiment on lighting a candle and what happens with water that she posted just last week. Um, kids drawing, learning the alphabet online, all kinds of fun things. Um, we continue to provide $1,458 uh, approximately every month that covers the four teacher salaries there in addition to let's just say approximately another ten thousand dollars a year uh, for their operations it could be for the tutoring program or the feeding program uh, the tree planting program the radio program I mean they they just do remarkable work um, we're really excited about the two to see days program which we highlighted in our pride month e-connections the way that they're working with young boys and women, girls, and the growing awareness of the trans community as well in El Salvador, so that kids have um, better control of and understanding of their bodies and, and their sexuality um, in a culture that tends to still be um, dominated quite heavily by machismo. Um, we also have provided $150 recently, as you can see, uh, to support families directly in that community with basic food baskets, which is sort of what people need to get through a week or a month, depending on the quantity. At Akumahersa, um, again, this is the name for what many of you will recall as Mujer and Comunidad El Salvador. Um, we have been working with them on a $6,000 loan uh, that they asked to receive to cover um, the cooperative members' salaries and work material costs. Uh, they make uh, basically school uniforms now as a large source of their income beyond the quinceanera and baptism and other things that they sowed in the past. And the payment from the government is always significantly delayed. And given the current situa extraordinary situation at the beginning of the year, they asked if there was any way that we could come up with $6,000, and we said uh, that we would try to do so over the course of um, six months. And so um, we've been providing these payments of $500, which I think will go up to $1,000 now um, going forward. I'm not sure the total Adela would know that if anyone's really concerned. But this is a great way for them to be able, basically with no interest, um, to access the materials they need to generate the income they'll get from um, producing what the school supplies and school uniforms that are required of them. And if you don't know, that's Adela with the IPM t-shirt on, I think, at, um, at left, the black t-shirt. Um, we also continue to partner with Akapamu. Uh, which in many ways is probably the community that we work with that is remains the most isolated and destitute. Uh, not a word I typically would use, but it literally is over the tracks in Armenia. And there's some real fear right now. The staff and I were talking yesterday about the spread of COVID uh, in the community. One of the neighboring uh, homes has a, someone who's tested COVID-19 positive and um, People are sort of afraid to come and use their grinder because it 
abuts that home. So that's raising all kinds of challenges. So yesterday we agreed to forward them um, an additional $500 um, as a short-term uh, stimulus since they're losing uh, quite a bit of income from their work. Um, we've also provided some direct donations related uh, to the need for groceries and food baskets. Um, and as you can see, each participant received three of these basic food baskets to get them through the first quarter of the pandemic, if you will. And we're about to re-up um, and provide that for the four women who are the leaders of the cooperative going forward as well. And again, when I say four women, probably talking about families of seven to 10 people that they're supporting. So somewhere in the neighborhood of probably 35 to 40 individuals being impacted directly by that. Um, EDIS is a newer partner of ours that some of you who haven't traveled with IPM to El Salvador recently would know about. Um, it's an acronym for an environmental development organization among mostly former combatants who live on very unproductive land uh, near the Rio Lempa in, in El Salvador. Uh, really a remarkable partner. Um, they used $500 to initiate a chicken farm project, which you can see there, which is run by the youth in the community, and another $1,000 donation to re repair the um, project sort of um, foundation. It says establishment, uh, which, was in, which was sort of in bad, uh, bad condition, the foundation of the building that they meet from. <laughs> One of the real challenges we've had, as I mentioned about not wanting to let anyone go, but also not having the immersion experience income relates directly um, to the guys. They, they tend to be men who coordinate our logistics and often provide security for the delegations that travel with us in different parts of the world. And there are different people that we use all over, um, but these three have found themselves in particularly difficult situations because they don't own their own business or their, well, Martin does own his own vehicle, but Carlos and Jared drive for others who are no longer contracting with them to drive uh, given the lockdowns in El Salvador and Kenya respectively. So at left um, is Carlos Quijada. Um, as many of you know, he's also been dealing with, um, uh, his wife has had a recurring bout of breast cancer and so we've been trying to be as supportive as we can of his family um, and recently made a $200 advance for him, um, which, which was quite helpful that Adela helped facilitate. Um, Martin is on the right. He uh, works with us in Nicaragua. He also works with Xavier University, which obviously hasn't been doing any travel. So he's lost all that income. Uh, and we just provided a similar donation to him to, you know, to help him and his family get through. And then Jared, who coordinates our office um, in Kenya, which is no longer a physical office, um, but in fact, he is uh, stuck up country, as they say, because travel within Kenya, unless you have special permission, is banned. We continue to provide him with a monthly stipend to support his work there, uh, particularly in getting funding and other kinds of support to our project partners around the country as best as he's able from where he's located um, at home. So I'd ask you particularly to think of those three and their families as well, because um, you know, apart from the little bit that IPM is able to do, they've really lost all their income. And in all three cases, most of them rely on income with the exception of Jared uh, from other uh, organizations that's much larger typically than we provide. Um, across Latin America, obviously we don't have offices in places beyond El Salvador, but we do have partners. Uh, the, one of the last immersions we did, the really two uh, international, myself and Alyssa in Kenya with Yale Divinity School and Andover Newton Seminary as well. And then uh, Vicky accompanied a group to Colombia, uh, a group from Holy Cross College. We also had a Stonehill College group uh, come to Maine and be with the Wabanaki, which Rosalie will talk about when she presents. Uh, but these are photos from that most recent um, de delegation in Colombia. The one at right is the Sacred Lake Guadavita, which is just one of the most beautiful places I've ever been on earth. You don't get a sense from that how high up you are, but it's well over a mile high. And it's a, uh, a lake that was sacred to the indigenous people in that community. And in fact, uh, it's 
the British uh, during the colonial period in Colombia tried to blow up part of the volcanic crater to drain the lake to access the gold uh, that they believe was at the bottom of the lake that had been left there as gifts to the goddess. Uh, the volcano is seen as um, a goddess and I won't get into too much detail, but where uh, the, the sacred divine male and female sort of community with one another. Thankfully, they weren't successful uh, in blowing up the crater. And it's a beautiful, as you can see, sort of turquoise colored lake and uh, just a highlight of, of those trips all the time. Photo at left is at the guest house in uh, Bogota. And uh, if you if you have Spanish, I should say that uh, next next Friday at two o'clock, our presentation will be led by Marta, who's the head of the uh, Center for the Formation of Peace uh, in uh, Ibagué, Colombia, and Luz Dari, who's a uh, caterer and sort of a graduate of that program, who started her own very successful business. They'll be presenting a week from Friday at two o'clock in the Spanish language forum. Um, in El Cercado, many of you know that Vicky and Aneda, pictured at right, uh, were caught in the Dominican Republic in quarantine and spent, gosh, I think two months there, not able to get back to El Salvador, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, but while they were there, it was really a wonderful opportunity for them to get to know the country better and to have this unplanned time with Joanna Peterson, who's pictured at left, talking to the older woman. Um, Joanna is one of two uh, Gringa partners we still have around the world, but she's been in the DR for almost three decades now, I think actually over three decades, um, and has two adopted Dominican daughters, Glory and Miriam, who Vicky and Aneta stayed with in the, um, in the capital. And we recently, as you see with many of these cases, made a $1,000 donation um, in support of their work. This is a summary. It says January 20th to July 2020. Um, it's really um, mostly through June. There's an, an additional 2,500 probably in project partner payments pending um, for El Salvador alone in the next couple of um, weeks. Um, those of you who've been around with IPM know that we used to make these large end of the year payments. And in some cases we still do that or quarterly. But we decided that this year, um, for a number of reasons, it made more sense to sort of get a little bit of money out the door, if you will, each month and to make these $1,000 donations. So as I said earlier, um, you can see some of those that were made. Um, this really doesn't include the uh, much of the COVID response. I mean, some of it is listed there. We have greater detail on that in another report, including the in-kind giving, which totals, I think, almost $5,000 by itself. Um, but this is just a listing of some of those donations. The material support, um, yeah, this is, I guess this probably doesn't include the India numbers that I'm thinking of and the money that was raised within El Salvador, but you can see directly in response, particularly to Tropical Storm Amanda, uh, we did a special, the regional staff coordinated a special fundraising campaign where they raised over $1,700 from fellow Salvadorans uh, and almost $650 in in-kind donations that were allocated to our partners. And um, for those of you who are watching and maybe not as familiar with international development or sort of economies uh, in other parts of the world, we would typically say in a country like El Salvador that um, you could multiply these numbers by 10 to get a rough equivalency of what the dollar value would be. But actually the impact, for example, in India um, you know, uh, you'll see a little bit later that with a thousand dollars, you know, you can provide 11,000 meals. So it really just depends on where you are. But I want to commend uh, Vicky and Aneda and Adela in particular for all the hard work and, and raising this additional support locally in response to Tropical Storm Amanda. Uh, these are some of these donations. The donations we just listed were for three uh, different project and community partners in El Salvador who had particular needs because of the water and the rain and the other impacts of the storm. So we donated food baskets and medicine, um, which you can see impacted over 100 families in different parts of the country, including EDES, which we spoke about earlier. These are photos from their location in Zac Zacatecoluca. It's always a hard one to pronounce. 
uh, with Aku Mohersa in Zaragoza. Many of you will recognize Julieta, a former staff member and still dear friend of IPM in the middle, or Vincenta on the right, um, and one of the families, one of the leading women at uh, uh, Lydia Cojola, the Patronato, who also works with Aku Mohersa and her spouse and two children. And then with the Patronato, Lydia Cochola, um, you know, the kids aren't able to be at school, but as you can see, Martita in the photo at right um, and Sandra at left, you're still helping folks get the kinds of supplies they need in the community. And obviously we'll continue to donate to them as, as they requested. They've been really good at sort of sourcing local donations, including masks and um, anybody that comes in and out of the community, as I think you saw at another forum, is um, they're talking to and making sure they have a mask on to try to keep the El Zaytay community as free of COVID as possible. Uh, the Artisanas de Del Mar in Isla Tassajara is a project, is really a community partner. This was an organization that Adela got intimately involved with during her studies at the Jesuit University of Central America, a friend of hers uh, and herself started working with them on psychosocial counseling. Um, it's a very isolated community. You need to take a boat to get there and uh, very difficult to get medicine and other supplies out to the island. So you can see um, some of that um, that was donated. And I was Is that El Salvador? Of. That's El Salvador? Yeah, that's El Salvador down by the, uh, oh my God, what's the uh, harbor that Reagan mined? Um, oh yeah. Between El Salvador and Honduras, you know, where Honduras and then Nicaragua mm -hmm. on the other side. I'll think of it in a minute, or maybe Adela, if she's on, can tell Go us. Fonseca. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, hey Joe, so that is Isla Tasajera in La Paz, and the the river that you see over there is Estero de Jaltepec. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Good. Of course. So, you know, Adela, who you just heard, had this great line that I just love, that solidarity is greater than any disaster. Um, I'm sure you probably can't read that little writing at the left any better than I can, but this is just sort of a graphic explanation of how the resources that were provided were allocated. 10% um, was for medicine, 14% for food, 11% for clothes, 23% uh, for masks and other kind of kitchen and cleaning supplies, and then 42% for construction materials, particularly roofs um, after Tropical Storm Amanda. Um, with, with the storm, it rained 10% of what El Salvador would typically get in one year just within 24 hours and it affected over 18,600 Salvadoran families. Over 20,000 people lost their homes and at least 15 people died during the floods. Um, IPM launched this immediate response appeal that we've talked about earlier um, and supported directly over 300 individuals from seven different communities um, in response and through the hard work of Adela, Vicky, and Aneda. Um, you can see here, this is where I had my number off earlier. The response to Tropical Storm Amanda was approximately $4,000 in money raised and supplies donated in country. Uh, to help meet that response and that need. Um, one of our partners that continues, as I mentioned earlier, to be in really dire need is Acapoamu or Musas Creativas, as it's known um, by the Salvadoran government. And we've donated uh, food baskets, medicine, construction materials, clothes, et cetera, uh, that's impacting more than 100 families in that community. And as I mentioned earlier, we're about to allocate some additional funding uh, for the program uh, next week. These are photos from Akuma Hair, so we can probably go through these a little bit more quickly, Ilsa. These are really photos and direct response to Tropical Storm Amanda. There are some of the tin roofs. You can see Carlos at right. Um, that were needed for the homes that were destroyed during the tropical storm. Um, somebody tell me Ako Bamor. I mean, I, I think I know what that is, but I want to make sure I translate it correctly. Uh, 
Hey Joe, uh, good morning everyone. So Akova uh, Moore, uh, it is, um, well, it's a Christian-based community. Uh, we just partnered with them recently, uh, starting uh, last year. And um, we donated some um, food resources uh, for all the families and communities that they support that are approximately 16 communities in the country, in different departments. Great. And is this photo in San Salvador or is that in Zaragoza? Where is that? This at? photo is in Santa Tecla. In Santa Tecla. Which, yes. for those of you who don't remember, is sort of a suburb um, on the outskirts of San Salvador. It actually, sadly, uh, its mayor is the son of Roberto Davison, the, the uh, Salvadoran uh, leader of death squads who um, was lauded very much by the Reagan and Bush administrations, who was directly responsible for the murder of Oscar Romero. And his son is now the mayor of this community. Um, but it's also a very, in many ways, uh, a lot of the religious organizations have their headquarters there because it's a little nicer and greener uh, than the capital city itself. And it's strategically located uh, between the capital and the coast. If you've read Bitter Grounds, the climatic scene in that book uh, takes place. It, it's sort of the rotary connecting San Salvador, Santa Tecla, and the road to uh, Zaragoza and La Libertad. I would just, if I, you don't have to go back to that slide, Ilsa, but just to point out that some of the supplies that are really necessary for people, you can see the cooking oil, the rice, the beans, um, but we had a long conversation with Mahesh yesterday, and Jared and I have talked about the real need for um, not only toiletries, but particularly feminine hygiene products for girls, which are very uh, costly and hard to access at a time like this, particularly if you can't get to a pharmacy. Um, or a um, supermercado in the capital. And so that's something that we're focusing um, on providing greater access to, particularly through the work in South Asia. But if anyone is interested in, in making more of those supplies available to the girls um, at the different schools and cooperatives we work with, I'm sure Anita, Mahesh, or uh, Adela, or I, really any one of us else would be happy to talk to you about that. Uh, this is a picture from New Travita. That's Anita. She's one of the uh, women who runs the actual base Christian community where the co-op is that we often travel to to buy some beautiful um, Salvadoran handcrafts. And she's preparing, as you can see, sort of individual bags. I believe that's of ground maize or corn uh, that's then distributed to the communities after having been bought, bought in bulk. So they go to family by family that way. Uh, and then some of the other supplies, obviously produce is really difficult to come by unless you can, um, you know, you have your own farm. So eggs as a source of protein are expensive, uh, but also vital um, as are beans and rice as sort of staples of the Salvadoran diet. Uh, just maybe move into South Asia with, with a little bit less detail here since we just heard last week from Mahesh uh, and Hemet. Uh, we continue to be in constant communication, obviously, with our partners there throughout India and Nepal. Uh, I think Mahesh and Fumadi, our board member from Nepal, are on today's call um, and really working as well within the country, particularly of India, India to provide food and material support for our partners. Um, we work with locally based partners there are fellows uh, and community partners who are particularly involved with the immersion experience program. Um, in India, you can see uh, this slide Mahesh provided uh, of the rise in cases. India, it says eight hours ago, that was probably eight hours ago as of about 8 a.m. our time uh, on the east coast of the U.S. Uh, and the numbers there are really growing. Uh, India now is um, you know right up there with Brazil as the third country in the world um, with cases and they anticipate uh, much like probably in the United States but even more so that they may not even be counting 10 percent of the actual caseload which is almost at 800,000 already up from like 80,000 just a couple of weeks ago. 
And I think you probably all saw that the president of Brazil tested positive after months of flouting um, appropriate social and physical distancing measures. Um, these are some of the organizations. I won't go through um, who all they are. You can see they work primarily with Dalits and tribal communities and migrant communities. Mahesh spoke quite a bit last week about um, the really terrible situation for migrant laborers in India, of which much of the um, sort of construction and basic labor force is, and the people are trapped. They can't get back to their homes where they have farms uh, and maybe ready access to produce and tea and those kinds of things, and instead are caught in major cities like Delhi and, and, and uh, Ahmedabad, where IPM is primarily located. Um, and so you can see the kind of support that's been provided. Um, 75 rupees to the dollar if you're looking for some context. So um, well, I'm not good enough to do that math right away, but um, $400 would be about 27,500 rupees. 275,000 rupees, I'm sorry. You can see the number of families. We made this point. I was on the call with some organizations in Cleveland as far as how they were responding. And it's an organization I love, but they were kind of crowing about, you know, 10,000 meals over a month. <laughs> you know, Hemet can, you know, 11,000 meals a week, you know? So you can just see the scale here. A um, couple thousand dollars, you know, you're supporting over 3,000 families. Uh, Hemet is our international fellow, and as you can see, he's facilitated almost $21,000 worth of relief to 4,368 families. Uh, and you can see sort of where that's come from and how that funding has been allocated. Um, IPM is, like I said, at about, um, I think we gave him, we provided about $1,000, and uh, there's some other major donors that they have that are working with them or from their own resources. If you're interested in learning more about their work, we're current or supporting them. We're currently putting together a proposal for a farming initiative uh, that is available through the Indian government that um, is probably gonna cost about $25,000 to get started, but that will generate over a quarter million dollars a year and in investment from the government if we can raise that. So Heman and Mahesh are working on that right now. And if anyone's interested in learning more about that um, or has friends in India or the Indian community that you think might be, please, please do let Mahesh or I know. Um, one of our, you know, oldest and best established partners uh, in India is HUM, Hindus United with Muslims. It was born out of the sectarian uh, riots the, when the Hindu nationalists attach, attacked the Muslims um, in Ahmedabad. Uh, that was fomented by the current prime minister uh, and is depicted quite graphically, if not exactly correctly, in the movie Slumdog Millionaire that I imagine many of you are familiar with. Um, the co cooperative of HUM transitioned pretty quickly because they do a lot of sewing into making facial coverings or mask, which they provided for about 500 women, children, and elderly persons. Uh, we're going to be making another donation to them uh, in the next week or two to allow them to expand that program further. And they've also provided food rations for over 100 women-led families, which includes, as you can read, 22 widows. Um, and the funding has provided almost 48, over 4,800 meals. And again, you can see these food baskets typically but tend to be either broken up by weekly or monthly allocations of oil, rice, dal in the case of India, beans in the case of um, Kenya or El Salvador or other parts of Latin America uh, that allow people to get, get through difficult times such as these, particularly with the markets closed. Up until the recent spike in cases, the story was that more people would die of hunger in India than of COVID, but you may not have seen the chart. I don't have it, I can't share it with you, but it's often done with sports figures where you can see like who had the most goals over a period of time in soccer. They just did one on the spread of the disease and COVID starting at basically zero 
at the beginning of the year, there's now been more COVID cases, almost double than malaria so far this year. Um, and so it's taken the place of malaria, which takes the life of a child every six seconds um, somewhere around the world as the number one, uh, <laughs> it's sort of a bad way to put it, but the, uh, the disease that has the greatest virulence and has infected the most people globally um, over the last six months with no end in sight, particularly in a place like India. Bodhjabai Foundation, we've talked a lot about. You've heard from Hemet a couple of times over the past months. Uh, they continue to do remarkable work. Hemet is our first regional fellow. Uh, he was appointed to that at our 40th anniversary. Um, and as you can read, he's distributed grocery packages. The foundation has to over 1,150 Dalit families. Dalit are sort of below the caste system. So they're at the absolute bottom, if you will, of the caste system in India. And that's allowed those people to produce more than 11,500 meals. Uh, and then they've also cooked food for 1,100 people. Um, we're going to be doubling our donation to them um, this coming month. So those numbers should go up significantly um, between now and September. Mochabai also, you know, they, they're based primarily in Golana. So that was more of a rural allocation from the bus. You could see her to the Dalid community. They also work directly with the Jat community, which are pictured at left, uh, which is a migrant community from Afghanistan that ended up in India after partition. And they still dress in very traditional clothing and are squatting on land that they don't own, that ideally um, someone would purchase for them. But Hemet has supported them and um, Hank Dow, among others, has helped uh, set up a simple school there for the children in that community. Uh, but here you can see that they were the food supply to 11,000 people, um, 15, 1,500 ration kits, homopathic medicine for over 5,000 families, 150 kits just to the Jat Sindhi communities, um, and then the dried snack and transportation and other things um, or other people from Golana. Golana is about, I don't know if Mahesh is muted, but it's outside of Ahmedabad, but still in uh, Gujarat, but much closer to the coast. And the soil is heavy, heavily salinated because it's an, primarily an estuary region. It's very difficult to grow much in that community um, on your own, unless you're working in a large plantation farming system, which is what most of the Dalits do. Um, this is, a, you can see sort of food distribution from the back of a rickshaw in the last photo and actual people gathering for a simple meal, um, particularly for the elderly and the infirmed. And again, these are people that, you know, sort of in, in our version of English might be called untouchables, uh, but the proper term is, is Dalit. Um, Also, Fumari is still on the call. Uh, this is, you know, hopefully we'll be hearing a little more from Nepal at our, Nepal at our forum next week. Uh, but our project partners remain in regular communication with uh, Fumari in particular there through Sony's work as a regional fellow. Um, and as, Sony, as you might have heard Fumari say, if you were on the call at the beginning, the cases are starting to appear in Nepal and um, it's very worrisome that in a rural community without access to water and electricity, the kind of impact and spread um, that um, could happen. Uh, Fumati has always, going back to her work with Leah Schulte, been very passionate about environmental justice and reforestation. And this is some photos of the recent tree planting project that they planted 150 trees there. Um, and you can obviously donate directly to that if you'd like to. Um, we're going to be sending a contribution there um, that Mahesh and Adela just approved yesterday in the coming weeks. In Sub-Saharan Africa has sort of been the hardest for us because, again, Jared can't get to Nairobi and we have a vacancy as the regional director. Um, there are other people that we work with as consultants, particularly Beverly Amali, who runs the travel company that we coordinate our emergence from. But again, she is sort of homebound and under quarantine. My own mother-in-law has been stuck uh, in Kenya for the last four months, unable to get back to Canada where she currently resides. Um, but we have made some donations. 
uh, through the generosity of a congregation in Massachusetts that's affiliated with a colleague of mine at Yale Divinity School, really at Andover Newton Seminary, which is now at Yale. A $500 donation was made to the Andorra Women's Forum, uh, which is the group of women you can see uh, pictured at right uh, in a, basically the second largest slum in Nairobi, uh, the third largest in all of Sub-Saharan Africa. And they provided 40 uh, food baskets for 40 uh, members, over 300 family individuals. We also bought our bracelets, which I wear and many of you do, uh, from them, which was uh, some income that was really helpful for them to have at this time. Our largest partner on a dollar sense in Kandula, you heard from my Terry's wonderful presentation uh, a couple weeks ago, um, is in Makweni, Kenya, formerly part of uh, Machakos. They've now divided that part of the country with the new Senate and governor um, administration that they have. Uh, we were there in January and provided about a $2,500 donation to buy construction materials. Over the past, uh, let's say, decade, IPM has been involved in both the nursery school setting through the Reichard family at the local parish and now a K through eight school building uh, with one classroom yet to go. Uh, we heard all the detail about that, but we've allocated about $20,000 over the past few years for the last two school buildings and have one more to go, um, which we'll be funding sometime soon. Um, and we, we needed the 2,500 to buy some supplies and then a $900 donation as well. Many of you will remember Gladys Unwar, the Franciscan sister with her hand raised at Wright, uh, just a remarkable community organizer in the Kisumu region of Kenya, where our board member Dorothy Yango and her husband Inyang, uh, Inyang is the governor of Kisumu, and uh, Dorothy is the head of the African Cancer Foundation and one of the newer members of IPM's International Executive Board. Riete Farm is about an hour, hour and a half outside of Kisumu, which is right on Lake Victoria. And, um, you know, it's been hard, uh, even though the land is reasonably fertile without seed uh, and without water, it's hard to grow anything. So we're in the process of a thousand dollar donation. I think it's actually going out today or tomorrow uh, that will go to Gladys so that she can uh, employ some of the farm workers and keep the farm going uh, with over 400 families directly benefiting from the produce that the farm uh, produces. Watoto Walawanga is a remarkable school. Many of you met Brother Hillary at our last General Assembly. It is now run by a remarkable woman, Jacinta, who uh, recently had surgery and asked to be kept in our prayers. Hillary is now the head of his religious order, the Brothers Charles uh, Lawanga, back in Kampala, Uganda, and Jacinta is eminently qualified uh, to run the program. Uh, Hillary and I have joked that we should hire her <laughs> to work for IPM, and we may do that on the side. She did accompany our delegation for a day uh, during the last trip. She's a really a remarkable woman who originally hails from Luo country, uh, and she has she's working with a couple of new religious brothers who have moved there for the school that has over 500 students. Uh, and they asked for a donation specifically to help with their feeding program. And you can see some of the distribution of that left. Um, and again, I would anticipate that we'll make, um, you know, in many of these COVID cases, as long as the situation doesn't improve, we'll probably be making these size donations um, as much as we're able to and are able to raise the money to do so. So I, I kind of, I saw this quote that wasn't attributed to anybody and I kind of made it my own. Um, but I, I think it's really important for those of us who are feeling tired, exhausted, a little worn out right now. And I'm sorry, I realize I've gone way over time. I wish somebody would have given me a sign. Uh, but, you know, we can feel uh, really weary, exhausted and tired at times like this. But I think part of that is also not because we're doing too much, but that we're focused on, our work is often focused on things that don't give us much life or don't give us much energy. And I just want to encourage you all, as I encourage, try to remember myself and remind my colleagues um, to focus on that, which gives us light and which gives us energy 
so that we can continue to be the change that we're called to be in the world. Thank you all for your support. And I think we could take a few minutes for uh, any questions or comments you have at this time. Anybody? I'm, I'm sort of looking online here. Uh, oh, Carol's asking about the dance videos. Yes, I mean, Vicki can answer that specifically, but I believe they were made available to everyone. Vicki, can you answer that? Hi, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Well, um, we have sent those to our project partners via WhatsApp. And I'm sure Nita will be working on getting those on the IPM uh, YouTube channel soon as well. Yeah, if you haven't seen the IPM YouTube channel lately, I would go to it. There was, you know, it was pretty stagnant for a while, but I'd say in the last six months, we've probably uploaded more videos than we have in the last six years. And many <laughs> of them are from Anita and Vicky. So we're really grateful for that. Any other questions or comments? Uh, uh, Mickey's, uh, yeah, sorry. There's one, is it difficult to do monetary transfer to some of these countries? Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> That's one of the advantages of working with IPM. Uh, we, uh, in Kenya, in El Salvador, we have non-profit status or non-governmental status. And so we have our own bank accounts and we do our own operations. In India, we work primarily as a partner uh, with existing projects um, through our fellows and immersion experiences and other initiatives. So um, donations that are made to us can be made directly right now to accounts in uh, Kenya, El Salvador, Nicaragua, uh, or Italy that are sort of IPM accounts. And then we can also make them directly to the accounts of our partners if they exist. And we try to do that um, you know, what's your number? A uh, couple thousand dollars minimally to go someplace. But we also do monthly transfers uh, to each of the regions. And so we've been including the donations from those. Um, Sarah Schick is asking about outside of Latin America and the Caribbean doing anything for mental health support. Uh, I, the answer is yes. Um, and I'd, I'd ask if Mahesh is on the call, I'd invite him if he wants to add anything. Anything about uh, mental health support work or social cycle counseling, Mahesh, uh, that you're aware of in India or Fumati for that matter in Nepal? Yeah, um, Parveen who is uh, uh, with Hindus United with Muslims. In fact, she's, uh, uh, she's what you call a lay psychosocial uh, worker. And she has been trained by the National Institute of Neuro, Neural and Mental Health Sciences in India. This was way back in 2002, and uh, she's applied those learnings and skills every time there's been a crisis or a disaster, uh, either man-made, like the riots in Gujarat, or the earthquake, uh, which is or the tsunami and things like that. So she and uh, two or three of her team members are well trained in that and a large part of their time goes away in spending time with a lot of young women, adolescent girls, single women, counseling them, listening to them. And I think listening is something I, I would not limit it to those who are trained in psychosocial care only. I think listening is integral to all of IPM's activities in India. So in that sense, it's not something that you especially do because there is a COVID crisis, but we do it most of the times uh, when we are dealing with individual lives. Um, while dealing with the migrants, uh, it has been a new experience for us to do counseling on the phone and uh, using media, modern media to reach out to people. But that has also been very much on the increase. Uh, there are people who want to share their stories, their frustrations. Sometimes, uh, there's nobody there with them. They are alone, they're lonely, especially the migrants who come from different parts of India, from Bihar, from Bengal, from Uttar Pradesh. India, as you know, is a multilingual country. We have more than 28 official languages and uh, 
english is not commonly spoken in that sense a large percentage of people don't know it so a person from bengal who speaks bengali can come to gujarat and not be able to read or write anything that is given to him or anything that he sees on the screen and luckily i mean i, I speak couple of languages so i'm able to reach out to them that way uh, and there are others who do that so language has been a big barrier sometimes we are just listening to people even though we don't understand their language but we throw in a few words and the idea is that they have their say they get to speak about their sorrows about difficulties that they are facing and very often we don't get to the problem until they have shared their uh, their mental uh, emotional states with us you know so, so it will be a couple of calls later and then they come down to what they really need you know whether it's material and assistance transportation so maybe 70% of our time goes in having conversations and listening and 30% of our time maybe or 25% of our time goes towards assessing what really is the problem and what really is the need i don't know if that gives you some kind of an idea of uh, the kind of uh, time we spend in conversations and listening but that like i said is uh, is the score of ipms work throughout the years whether it's uh, an international crowd who is on an immersion program whether it's a local person an international person listening and accompanying people has been a core part of our work so in that sense it's not new but it's become very intense the last few months yeah no and i thank you for that input mahesh and i i know that that's been a huge part of the work of our staff in sub saharan africa uh particularly the colleagues um who were graduates of the gregorian university in rome much like um Vicky and Adela are of the UCA in San Salvador um to spend time sort of part of the whole understanding of solidarity and the movement for social justice is related to um you know how we stand in solidarity with one another and how we accompany one another and there's a wonderful quote from uh the poet Bell Hooks who I think some of you know and probably have seen um Adela used in some of her presentations of late about how you know being in solidarity or being in partnership as IPM often says um you know is about having a community of interests of shared beliefs and of goals around which we unite and that that sense of solidarity and accompaniment can't be occasional it has to be constant and the accessibility and the willingness to listen uh that Mahesh highlighted um is a huge part of what accompaniment and partnership is all about um leading with listening if you will which i think is good advice as well for all of us who are concerned and involved with the movement for racial justice in a, in our own nation in the USA now um just the just the importance of, of being willing to listen and let people share their stories and to do the hard work ourselves and getting up to speed about why people are living in the situations they are why they're fearful of the police and the way they might be uh similarly what it might be like to be a dalit woman uh of color in a place like golana or an indigenous woman of color in armenia um who are really shunned and for ever since the conquest <laughs> columbus and the conquistadores you know the indigenous people particularly in places like el salvador in Nicaragua and Colombia, Brazil, the DR where where we work throughout the region have always been um the most marginalized and ostracized and impoverished members of society. So listening is a huge part of that and um you know I'm not trained as a psychologist or sociologist but it's a big part of what I what I do um personally and um I think anyone who has background in that is interested in doing more and supporting more of that kind of work is would be helpful for us. So thank you Sarah and Mickey and Carol. I think Clint did you have a question? I think we could take one more and then we should probably. Uh I was just wondering is El Salvador is still on lockdown I assume uh, and the airport is still closed basically. Is that right? Yeah, I'll let I'll let Vicky or or Adela respond to that directly, but the situation is um is not getting better. <laughs> yeah. Uh in some ways they're following our trajectory because their president follows our president. So yeah. I don't know Vicky Bella, you want to say anything about that? I think you're muted. Um Hi, Joe. well 
Okay. Well, so um, yes, the situation in El Salvador is still um, the same. We are in the first phase, um, but the airport and uh, I mean, like normal life that we used to have is still stuck at this moment. Uh, just some, uh, the only thing that you can do is that, I mean, you have like uh, freedom to go out of your house, um, but only supermarkets or markets are opened and banks, but nothing else. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Anita. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, but yeah, just to add to what Anita said, there is also a lot of um, confusion in some cases going around because of the law. Uh, since the president and um, and all of the all of the government are having um, some sort of clashes uh, between each other. Uh, a lot of the population doesn't know what is legal to do, or is it legal to go outside, and some others do, but are still scared to do so. So, yeah, that's uh, mainly what's going on as well. Yeah, thanks, Vicky. Thank you. Thanks for that question and that input, Anita and Vicky. Um, as I mentioned, um, you know we're we're hopeful, Clint, and I know you and I have talked about this that there will be we will have the ability to travel there by the end of November. Uh, we're not sure that that's the case, and uh, some of you know that we had an internal deadline of July 15 to have the virtual immersion experience program up and running to go. Uh, Vicky has basically completed all of the basic material and sample itineraries related both to uh, country, in this case El Salvador, and theme around gender equity and the human rights, human rights of women and girls. And we'll be sending out a mailing to all of our existing and lapsed immersion experience partners in a couple weeks once we've uh, completed the build out of the section of the website that will be re directly related to the um, immersion experience, the new virtual immersion experience program. So um, Clint and others, you should be expecting an email from us uh, by the end of the month or early next month with details on how to follow up with yeah. virtual immersion experience programming. And yeah. also wonderfully for some of you who I, I won't name, who I'm looking at on the screen, who I know have always wanted to go on an immersion, but maybe not been able to physically do so, uh, as much as you'd like, that now you'll literally have an opportunity to be with IPM and our partners in over 12 different countries around the world um, during the coming year, thanks to the real hard work of Vicki, Adela, Alyssa, and so many others, the committee that Clint has been working with and helping us roll out this new program. So um, that being said, uh, we're a little bit over time, but I think we're okay. Uh, next week, our plan is to have a presentation from Sony Shrestha, who's our regional fellow in Nepal. We may move it up to 10 o'clock just to accommodate the radical, fairly significant time difference there. We don't want to be on the call with her at midnight uh, since she's a mom and uh, doesn't want to be on the call at, at that time. Um, and we are doing a two o'clock call this afternoon again with Maria Felix from Mujer and Comunidad in San Francisco, uh, Libre, Nicaragua. And then next Friday at two o'clock, uh, with Luz Dari and Marta Arroya of the, uh, Central for La, Cent the Center for the Formation of Peace uh, and the children who work in the workplace in e by gay uh, program. So those are all wonderful um, opportunities for you to engage directly with IPM's work again next week, probably at 10 a.m. in English, and then this afternoon and next Friday at 2 p.m. in Spanish. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time and all that each and every one of you is doing to help make the work I highlighted possible. Uh, none of it could be done without each and every one of you. So thank you for that. And may the peace that passes all understanding be with you throughout this weekend and the days ahead. Take care. Yep. Take care. Thanks.